We're really glad you're here today. Uh, I'm going to preach just for a little while uh, out of the Bible. We believe that God has given us a clear definition of truth through his word, his written word. We believe that we read scripture, we study scripture so that we don't fall into temptation to form God into our own image, but we actually are formed into him, his image by the way that he has given us through his scripture, through his word. We believe that God has a preference, and when we study his word, we find out his preference on how we worship, how we live, how we give, how we love. And so we're going to dive into scripture for just a few moments this morning. Um, does anybody have a Bible with them, a physical Bible this morning? Physical Bible people. Uh, good job. Great job. Kudos. Anybody else going to get a little extra credit? Just want to get a little extra credit real quick? Awesome. You got a case. Anybody have a carrying case? Amazing. Two, two people. Um, I got the large print this time. You guys know you could do that? It's decent. And I'm going to read from the iPad. So... We have the Bible in the sky. Um, we're going to go to John 6. This might be a familiar passage um, to you, something that you may have heard multiple times in Scripture, in church, or read in your own devotional time with the Lord. But uh, this week, I just felt God on it. I was, uh, we're kind of in between series at the moment. We've got Sam coming next weekend, and we'll kick off some stuff heading into the end of the year. But um, one of my favorite things to do uh, when we go, we went on vacation for a few days, um, and uh, we, we go to Newport Beach, and oh, sorry, I was supposed to release the youth. If you're in junior high or high school, can you leave? <laughs> Bless them. I think someone, because I got phones now, they just text, hey, where you at? But if you are junior high or high school, you can go now. Amazing. God bless you as you go. Come on, can we give it up for the youth, <laughs> junior high? You can go to the salon. Um. We go to Newport Beach. It's like our, our vacation spot. We got some family down there, but we didn't see any of them. Uh, saw some friends and hung out for a few days. But one of the reasons I love going there is because I, I wake up real early in the morning and I'll go down to Corona Del Mar, uh, which is the, the setting or the space where the Jesus people movement happened. It's the epicenter. Uh, my parents were baptized at Pirate's Cove in Corona Del Mar in the 70s, and uh, so I go down there re early in the morning, watch the sunrise, and I just feel the Lord speak in those moments and put fresh vision in my heart for what could happen in our day and age, and um, so I, I'm fresh off a, a week of early mornings at Corona Del Mar, um, but I just felt specifically the Lord highlight John chapter 6 in my early mornings with him, so we'll read it, I'll talk about it for a little bit, and then we'll go eat. It says this, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish uh, Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Then Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there, which we could assume about fifteen to 20,000 people were present. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did this. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet, capital P, who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for 
your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you as teacher, as guide, um, as the revealer of truth to come and exalt Jesus in our midst. Uh, God, I'm asking that you would take uh, simple words and intentions and do something supernatural with them this morning. God, we uh, right now lift up the church of the Central Coast, wherever people are gathering under your name. We ask that you would bless them today. We ask that all boats would rise today as churches gather, that souls would be saved, that the blind would see, the deaf would hear, and ultimately the good news of the kingdom of God would be preached. And uh, we lift up Pastor Pat today. He's ministering in Europe. And uh, so, God, I thank you for fresh wind in Pat's sails today as he ministers across Europe this week. Would there be great fruit from those moments? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. But hey, there's a ton to unpack in this passage of Scripture, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but there are a few things I feel like God uh, would want to communicate to us today. But specifically, this is important that John, in his writing, highlights that this was during the Passover meal. This was during Passover season. John references this earlier, earlier in his writings, if you remember, where Jesus goes to clear out the temple. Uh, if you're not familiar with that story, Jesus, he observes the condition of his father's house, uh, and it was turned into a den of robbers. It was people money handling within the very temple of God. And he goes, fall, goes to sleep on it, comes back the next morning, uh, brings out his whip, turns over tables, it was during the Passover feast because it was symbolic. It was, it was this upheaval of an old way of doing things that we reference to the Old Testament of there was going to be a new way. There was an old temple system. There was a way that, that had gotten corrupt in a sense. It had gotten stale. It had gotten about works, and God was going to upend that whole thing and turn it upside down. And so he references in John chapter 2, this temple moment. And then fast forwarding to John 6, we see this Passover season happening again, and specifically, this has to do with food, which we're really thankful for. If you read through all of John 6, it's, it's a whole bunch about food, because the reference here is that this, this gospel in chapter 6 is dominated by this theme that the fact that God fed the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings with bread from heaven, remember that. The story is from Exodus 16 where the manna is provided, manna being food that just fell from heaven by God's provision because the people were grumbling and complaining. There's multiple aspects of the story to give important background for John 6. And as we go into this, I, I, I want to remind you that in this moment, uh, Jesus is a rabbi. Uh, I, I love that Jesus doesn't just tell people what to do. He actually helps people how to think. Uh, at this church, we've made that commitment. I, I'm not just going to tell you what to do. I want to help you know how to think. Romans 12, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so I, I want you to understand that here is a rabbi in a teaching moment bringing all the history of the Old Testament to sit on a hillside with some common disciples, specifically Philip and Andrew. And if you study Philip and Andrew, I love this about these guys. They were networkers. Uh, they were guys, we'll see in just a moment, Andrew happens to know a kid with fish in this moment. And there's other references throughout the New Testament as Philip and Andrew are following with Jesus that they were just common guys that made friends really quickly and really well. So I want to go back to the text a little bit because this is important to understand. In verse 6, verse 5, Jesus looked up, he saw a crowd, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Verse 6, it says, He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus is submitting himself to the opinion of a lowly person. Jesus, he knows exactly what to do. He knows how to make miracles happen. As a matter of fact, the Bible just told us that everyone came to that mountainside because all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. But there he is as a rabbi, as a teacher, asking Philip, what do you think we should do about this? That's fa fascinating to me. When I read that, I had so much hope. Because <laughs> the amount of times that I go through my life and I just want clear directives from God. Anybody else? I'm like, God, just tell me what to do. But he's like, what do you want to do? <laughs> this is Jesus the rabbi. He's teaching us. We, 
the reality is Philip doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Andrew doesn't know what to do. But he brings the boy and the, his bread and the fish. He just brings it to Jesus' attention. So the, the point is really obvious, but we just need to be reminded of this point. We ourselves often have no idea what to do. <laughs> but the starting point is always to bring what is there to the attention of Jesus. You can never tell what he's going to do with it. But a primary part of Christian faith is the expectation that he will do something we hadn't thought of, something new, something creative. So what God has in mind is actually something that we have not thought of, but he still actually cares what we think. We're not just pawns in the story. We're not just taskmasters in our relationship to God. He actually cares what we think and how we think. Why didn't just, he just tell Philip what to do? I just wrote this, because when Jesus says something, we'll ultimately believe he has what it takes to do it. Jesus said something, he'll do it. I have no problem with what he says and what he will do. Where I have a problem, and the real challenge is, is not just seeing what the all-sufficient, all-knowing, all-powerful God can do when he says he is going to do something, but the challenge is, is that you and I seeing what the powerful thing God can do with our pitiful selves. <laughs> I have no problem with him starting, his sustaining, his initiative, all all of that, and yes, we believe that God speaks and he fulfills his word, it doesn't return void, but I think there's a good case to be made throughout scripture that God sometimes looks over and he's like, what do you think we should do? I'm like, well, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> I hadn't really gotten to the place with God where I started to actually dream and imagine and create. But it's this principle that God can actually do a whole lot with a whole little and the question I began to ask myself when I was reading this this week is, you know, all, all these big ideas of, of revival and awakening and the last, you know, probably 10 days or two weeks have been full of that. And we won't turn the dial on believing God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We won't turn the dial on that. But I started at question, in all that, does that mean that my personal ambition must go away in light of this sort of vague, ambiguous idea of the kingdom of God? Or is there room that God actually wants to birth, to bring, and to grow something inside of individual people where we could partner with him in initiatives? And if you have no clue what I'm talking about, I'm going to try to explain my inward dialogue. Because I think there's a rock-solid case to be made in Scripture that God is not looking for taskmasters to do what he says. Even though, I want to be very clear, we just do what Jesus says to do. I think there's a case to be made right from the beginning when God gave Adam a job. And that job was, it was really creative. God gave Adam a job to name animals. And people think, oh, work is a result of the fall. No, God actually gave Adam something to do before the curse. He gave him a job to do. And he said, Adam, there's something inside of you that is able to name animals. <laughs> There's something creative on the inside that just needs to make its way outside, and it's not the plan B, it's not the second choice. God, creating man in his own image, destined us to be creative ourselves, to actually dream a little bit, to imagine a little bit with him. And the beautiful thing throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament narrative specifically, is that there's like this elasticity between point A and point B. And we often think of faith as hopping on a train, and we get on that train, we just, you know, sit and enjoy, and then we just end up at our destination. But my dad always says, no, faith is way more like a sailboat. <laughs> like, you hop on that sailboat, and, then, and you just start turning your wind to the, your sails to the wind, and I, I, I'm convinced of this now. There's moments where like God's like, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> like, well, I thought this was all about just like getting from here to there. He's like, no, what, what do you think we should do? Why? Because he's not looking for taskmasters. He's looking for students. He's looking for people who will grow in understanding his will, his way, and actually the way that he thinks. So maybe you're not tracking with my question that I'm asking in my mind. But I want to propose something I think is really important for followers of Jesus to understand, that God actually wants to partner with you in creating some stuff. John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Do we agree? 
The enemy's work is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so if we can see the obvious plan of the enemy, how do we understand the obvious plan of God for our lives? If that's his strategy, I love this idea that we combat the work of the enemy by this. When the enemy's stealing, killing, destroying, we give, we grow, and we create. I believe God's actually looking for partners to give, to grow, and to create. It's like this John 6 moment here where Jesus is testing Philip on this principle. Like, is your paradigm for kingdom advancement just on your natural paradigm of like, well, it's actually going to take just months. We'll we'll get the work done. By then, everyone will be dead and gone. But this paradigm that it's not just according to natural means that God wants to operate and work through your life, but he does want you to think about it. It's based on partnership with Jesus to give, to grow, and to create. And I believe there are absolutely things we should have personal ambition towards. Not selfish ambition that's just self-seeking and self-serving, but ambition that's directed towards giving, growing, and creating. Jesus to Philip, what do you think we should do? I just wonder, could you answer that question if Jesus asked you that today? This is what I was confronted with this week. If Jesus came alongside, and we obviously see a problem here in John chapter 6, a lot of people need food, and my life and how that's relevant, I I see a bunch of problems. (laughs) I I see a community that needs Jesus. I I see children that need raising. There's a lot of problems in my life and things that require solutions, but Oftentimes, I'm looking for this, God, just what are you saying? What do you want me to do? One foot in front of the next. I know people that don't wear a certain T-shirt unless God tells them to first thing in the morning, which God bless you, that's cool. Um, He probably didn't tell me to wear this one, but. But like if Jesus came to you, and this is what I want to propose to you, and you see a problem, and he's like, what do you think we should do about it? Is that thing running on the inside of you? Is that motor turning on the inside of you? Is there some sort of ambition on the inside of you that's alive and awake? I know for me, for a long time, it just wasn't. Just survival mode, trying to endure, trying to get through, trying to keep head above water with young kids and pandemics and all the other things, long list of challenges. But I just wonder, is that motor running on the inside of you that when Jesus comes and he's like, what do you think we should do about it? That there might be something that God wants to partner with you on. I know that some stuff I'm believing for uh, will take a while. So I, just for a moment, I'll talk about what happens between my believing and God fulfilling in this idea of the fruition process and this, this idea this idea is that God won't grow what you refuse to plant. And so I think a lot of times we're sitting and waiting for this clear directive from God, but God's like, well, what do you have? (laughs) He's like, what is it in your life? Uh, There's this, Philip and Andrew find the little boy with a couple fish and a few pieces of bread. And he's like, well, we can make something with that. But I want to propose to you that sometimes I think we're just waiting too long and not just giving God simply what we have. And I'm not talking about just money or finance. I think specifically God was highlighting some ideas. Like there's some people that are inventors. There's people that are clever with business. There's people that have some things that we need that I think we underestimate this idea that sometimes Jesus comes along. He's like, well, what do you think we should do about it? I think there's some people in the room that have some amazing solutions on what to do about some stuff. I mean, people have this crazy creativity that's just untapped because of a season of surviving. Like God actually wants to captivate our imagination so that when he comes and he asks, what do you think we should do? We actually get to start working together on some stuff. But what I've seen Over and over, we're talking about the fruition process, so God doesn't grow what you refuse to plant, so just do something, give him something, some some effort, something that he can work with, and the other thing that happens in the fruition process is the greatest enemy to your faithfulness, fruitfulness, is always your impatience, and so we also don't love this sort of model of God partnering with us because it's not quick. (laughs) I'm just saying, yes, we sit, we ask God, Tell us what to do, and I'll just do that. But I just want to convince some people that's not always the way it works. It's like, first, just give me something that I can work with, and then wait a whole long time. (laughs) 
like years, like decades. Like I bet we aren't even gonna see the full fruit of some of the stuff we're working on right now in this moment for 20, 30, 40 years. But it's easier if we just, well, God, just do that. I would love miracles and signs and all of that stuff. We believe and we contend, but that stuff's really fun because it's really sudden. But the greatest enemy to your fruitfulness is always your impatience because God takes way longer than you want him to take to see dreams, passions, vision, and creativity expand and grow in your life. So God doesn't grow what you refuse to plant. The greatest enemy to your fruitfulness is always impatient. And the third thing is that it's important in these moments when we feel dreams start to arise and awaken, and, and, and I hope that's happening, there's creativity in the room, that we're just faithful with small opportunities. Because <laughs> I think a lot of times we're, we're waiting for this great, big grand moment you know, our arrival moment. And I think it's such a funny thing these days that young people are so captivated by doing something that they have purpose in. I think you should have a career. You should, if you have the luxury of that, to do something that you care about, that you're passionate about, all that is really cool. I just wanna say that's like a new thing. (laughs) That's totally 21st century stuff where you have the choice of what you get to do. (laughs) Like to, to, you know, be a whatever you want to be. And like 50, 60, 70 years ago, a lot of people in this room would remember, like that's not the luxury that most people had. Like you just work at the farm and the plant and the mine. (laughs) So how does that actually boil down in this tension of like God wants us to be creative. He wants us to do things that expand his kingdom and, and all of this stuff. But the tension of like, it's actually like a 21st world century problem to like be discontent because you're not doing something that's like super purposeful. (laughs) But what I want to propose is that always we have the opportunity to undo the works of darkness in those three ways, to give, to grow, and to create. It's really simple. I'm going to skip over some stuff and go, uh, we can skip over. I was going to talk about, you know, this crazy story about like, you guys know this story? When, uh, People ask Jesus if, like, he pays taxes, and then to pay his taxes, he tells Peter to go get money out of a fish's mouth when he goes fishing. You guys heard that story? Anyways, it's really cool, but we're not going to talk about it. (laughs) I guess the point is really simple. I just felt convinced that some people have been confused because they haven't been a, given a clear directive by God. And it's like Philip, and where there is a presented problem, and God might just be asking you, what do you think we should do about it? And I just sense as I was praying and thinking about our church, and you know, individual people, just the frustration. I, I was with a friend in Orange County just the other day, and he's just frustrated. He's like, God just hasn't told me exactly what to do. Like, yeah, I wish he did that all the time, but I would imagine that there's a common agreement that most of our Christian life is spent waiting and wondering. (laughs) What are you saying? What are you doing? And so I, I would hate for us to miss opportunities and moments and years and months and weeks and days and hours of our lives because Jesus hasn't given a clear directive when all along it's like, well, what do you think we should do? And I think what he would say is that would you partner with me in giving and growing and creating because there is no timing involved. There's no specific directive involved. There's no window of opportunity involved. There's no show up and blow up moment involved. It's the simple, faithful obedience of continuing to give to the people around you, to continue to grow personally and continue to create with God. It's five loaves and two fish sort of stuff. God, this is what I have and do what only you can do with it. It's really simple, it's underwhelming, but I feel like in this moment, God wants to turn our attention to start dreaming with him again, to start exploring with him in these simple ways. How can I give, how can I grow, and how can I create? How can I undo the works of darkness in my world in partnership with Jesus? There's no greater work than that. And so, Lord, I thank you right now in this moment with eyes closed and head bowed. God, that somehow, some way, 
we would understand this invitation of Jesus in John 6. Like, he knows fully what to do. He knows fully what to do. But to test Philip, thanks for making that better. Media. I want you to get this. John 6, 6. Jesus knew full well what he was going to do. But to test Philip, he asked him, what should we do? So God, I ask that you as rabbi, as teacher, would come and start to undo layers and layers of disappointment. Places where we, we've stopped dreaming, we've stopped collaborating. I love the hunger in people's lives to wait for a clear directive from heaven. I, I think it's the model, it's the way, but I do think that there's opportunities at times where you come as teacher and say, well, what do you think we should do about it? I just see people sitting in front of tables with blueprints of all kinds of solutions to the world's problems. I see people using their giftings and not just creating artwork and stuff on easels with pins and papers, but I see people having the incredible ability to have conversations that no one else can have. I see teachers in the way that culture has tried to destroy young people actually showing up to their classroom on Monday with creativity in their spirit to be able to lead young people into flourishing and life and healing and identity. God, I thank you for engineers and entrepreneurs and stay-at-home moms and people in positions where they're influencing others. God, I ask for a new zeal to create with you, to be imaginative with God, to see what you might do with a few loaves and a few fish. God, our confession this morning is that we do not have much to offer and we don't know what to do. But we bring some stuff to your attention this morning, like Philip and Andrew. But God, there is this. There's this little dream in my heart. There's this little desire. God, I'm pretty good with numbers. I think, I, I think I'm good in conversation. I think I'm a people person. That might be a little something. God, I... I haven't really thought about it before, but, you know, I'm, I have this ability, you know, when people are really angry and upset, I, I could just disarm people in the room. <laughs> it's like, well, that's something. That's loaves and fish. Sort of. Imagine what God might do with that. I had this, um, I grew up with ADHD, which, uh, Someone laughed because they just listened to me for 20 minutes. I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. But uh, I got on this medication when I was a kid, and I did really good at school for a while. But I felt like death. I was like hyper focused on medication. My dad took the medication one time on a road trip, and uh, he felt like his eyes were going to pop out of his head because he was like so focused. He's like, yes, yeah, son, you're not going to. This isn't going to be you anymore. And uh, it was really frustrating. I don't know if you've dealt with ADD, ADHD, attention disorders. I think everyone's got a little bit of that now because of our phones. But it can be a little frustrating. And uh, I saw it as like a great weakness of mine. I couldn't focus, couldn't pay attention. I couldn't complete tasks. And uh, I just felt in this moment with Jesus one day that he let me know that that little thing quirk about me. It's not actually a weakness. It's something God wanted to use as a strength in my life. I just began to picture how quickly and thoroughly I can process situations and outcomes and just think through stuff. And God began to speak identity over my life. He said, no, you don't have ADHD. You have a kingdom factory in your mind. You're always thinking about stuff. It's awesome. Think about it. Let your mind wander. Get creative. I don't know what it is in your life, 
But every time Jesus comes around, it's like, well, what do you think you should, we should do? And like the last thing you would ever think of is like, God, do you want to use my ADHD somehow? <laughs> but I just wonder if there's loaves and fishes in your life that simply need to be brought to Jesus' attention to feed multitudes, to feed masses. So God, I thank you that you're able to do a whole lot with a whole little. God, I thank you that you have the desire not just to see us as robots or taskmasters, but you actually desire to partner with us in the reconciliation of all things. And God, I ask somehow this biblical truth, partnership with people, would go deep into the heart and DNA of Equippers Church. We be people motivated and on mission to partner with you. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and so on. I want to thank you for dreams, for vision, for revelation about what you have for us in this continued commitment. No matter what, I'm just going to give. I'm just going to grow. I'm just going to keep creating with God. And it's going to undo the powers of darkness. So would you help us? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipperscc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by Clippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.